Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Teledyne ISCO's November webinar. Today's webinar is focused on reaction chemistry and pumps. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please utilize the chat function within the Zoom platform. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation is being led by Nick Dadabo, Teledyne ISCO's pumps product line manager. And at this time, I will turn it over to Nick. Great, thank you, Tori. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, just wanted to take a little bit of your time and to talk about uh, reaction chemistry and pumps and just kind of touch on some highlights and see, uh, talk about how pumps relate to reaction chemistry experiments applications. Um, we'll talk a bit about different pumping technologies and how and the applications that they might uh, come into play within flow chemistry, reaction chemistry. We'll talk about some of the key things you need to think about when you're setting up your uh, application or your experiment. So uh, as we get on here, let's, uh, let's get moving. So first off, just a quick introduction. Um, I'm our pumps product line manager for Teledyne ISO. Uh, I have been in pumps for uh, about 13 years in different types of bumps, pumps in the R&D side, in scale pilot, and in production. Um, and yeah, I've been, been in a lot of the focus markets like oil and gas, uh, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, food and beverage, plastics. So a kind of a wide experience, uh, experience but also uh, seen a lot of different applications within those industries from the three areas I just discussed as far as production, scale pilot, and R&D. So um, that being said, let's move on to the next slide. The overview uh, for what we're going to talk about today is we're going to focus on how the pump relates to continuous processing. In our reality, you know, in a lot of cases, I'd say a very, very vast majority, um, the pump is the heart of the reaction. So uh, fluid, need, fluid needs to be moved, material needs to be moved, um, and to do that, you would typically need some type of moving mechanism, which most of the time is going to be a pump. We're also going to talk about different types of pumps and what their applications may be within uh, the application. Uh, continuous processing, reaction chemistry, flow chemistry, they're, they're, they're similar terms. Sometimes have a little different meaning from each other, but they, they're kind of focusing in on one, one type of uh, chemical uh, work. And, and all of that, those three terminologies work right across the many major markets, including pharmaceuticals, plastics, oil, gas, and chemical. Um, and as I said before, the basics of this process can actually apply in the three boxes I talked about uh, on a smaller scale in the lab and R&D uh, as you set up a pilot plant or set up to try to scale up your process that you've just discovered to create a new medicine or a, true, a new chemical out of, uh, out of the reaction. And obviously it can go to a much higher level for, for production. Um, and that can be either at a small batch production case, it can be limited batch, or, and I say batch not in the type of processing, but limited uh, grouping or full scale production. So this type of processing works across all three boxes of, of industry. So let's talk a little bit about what flow chemistry or chemical reaction chemistry is. Most of this we probably already know, but I want to touch on some key pieces here just so we can kind of keep it within the scope of the conversation. You know, uh, obviously flow chemistry and reaction chemistry that are a continuous processing. A reaction is run that has a continuously flowing stream rather than just thrown into a, um, uh, a mixer or a, a bat to create the reaction. Uh, you know, things, pumps move fluid into a tube, into a reactor, and, and they contact each other and things happen. So it's a very, very generic uh, description, but it's the basis of our conversation. Uh, it's a well-established technique that's used at large scale for large quantities. It's used at small scale for small quantities. But really, um, you know, you'll have to have the pumps are the harder reaction, but you have to have a reaction vessel also. So there's some other key pieces that are important, including micro as like just stated here. Real quickly, let's look at the difference between the two types of chemistry uh, applications. You know, we talked about batch. You can see on the left of the slide there, the reaction mixtures into a vat. It's very classic. Um, a lot of facilities are doing this 
day to day right now. And you know, you get the reagents moved into the reactor. It's mixed with a with a with a uh, stationary or a mixture that's on the top of, or the bottom of the uh, reactor, and then it's left to react. You know, and the things are collected at the end, clean, completed, and cleaned up. Some key factors there are the mixing, the reaction time, et cetera. But when you look at flow chemistry, you know, I say it's a new technique here. It really isn't a new technique. It's been around for a long time. But it's a type of technique that's getting a lot more focused recently. Um, so, you, you know, you've got very simply two reagents coming into a certain uh, container or reactor, and a reaction mixture comes out. And then usually it goes to a collector or into a, another type of, of uh, collecting device. You know, the key factors there are the flow rates and the, uh, the residence time, the temperature, and the mixing. Some of the advantages of this type of processing or this type of reaction chemistry is you're going to get a uniform product, uh, especially as you have pumps that are putting out a very pulseless straight stream or a pulseless straight um, uh, flow of the chemicals. You get a longer run production, you can make a larger volume, you can keep it going, or you can turn it off and just have the application stop. Um, less time to have to worry about cleaning up and shut down. Um, it's easier design, less contamination. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some disadvantages, sometimes it can be an expensive initial setup. Uh, some, of the, some of the equipment would be expensive to purchase to, to, to create the, the manufacturing flow or the, the processing flow. But it's, uh, you know, it's set up and also sometimes a disadvantage considered uh, if it's set up for just one product, um, which it could be advantage too because it eliminates contamination and then when you're done, you just throw off the disposable pieces and you start over again. So that can be advantage or disadvantage. Here are a couple of pictures I just literally just found on the internet, but I thought they were great descriptions of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, when you look at the top one in the upper left corner, you know, you see two pumps pumping something into a micro reactor. A reaction happened, you had manual collection. Very, very simplistic uh, description of this process. And you can see, you know, the pump is, as far as the basics here, is very important. The fluid would not move without that, right? In the second reaction, the second picture down in the lower right, uh, that same thing is very true. Uh, you can see two pumps and putting into a T connector and there's a little flow reactor where the, the chemicals kind of react. And then you have uh, a collection of uh, silver nanoparticles at the end. So, uh, you know, both of these are very, very generic descriptions and pictures because, you know, some processes and applications have uh, up to 20, 30, 40 parts and pieces and lengths and designs and uh, you know, valves and all this stuff. But on a very, very rudimentary description of how we're looking at this, these, these two pictures depict what we're talking about. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about pumps within reaction chemistry. Very, very basically, you know, we, we will say that the pumps are the most important part of a continuous processing system. Fluid has to move, material has to move. The way to do it is through a pump. You know, you, you really want to consider key pieces to what, what you're trying to accomplish. You know, the accurate flow rates, the ability to fluctuate your flow rate range, uh, maximum chemical compatibility. You do not want your materials or your chemicals reacting with anything within the pump or within even actually the whole process um, that would degrade the potential uh, mixture rate or cause contamination. Uh, low to minimal material pulsations. Now, this isn't always a concern, but uh, if you need, you know, in some cases when you describe, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, the, this, the pulsation right here isn't always a concern. Sometimes you just want to get the fluid in there. If it goes in, it has a blip when it goes in, that's fine. But other times you need to be very precise, steady stream, steady flow to get the right amount of dosage uh, of that material to mix with the other materials that you're trying to, uh, you're bringing in to create that third one. Sometimes too much can cause and change the reaction or change the whole makeup or the structure of the experiment. You have to be very, very wise, wise and considerate of that. And there's pumps out there that, um, that can vary their pulsation rate. We'll talk about that later. 
the uh, the footprint of the product that you have. I mean, obviously, everybody's lab today has a has limited space in most cases, especially under a fume hood, et cetera. So you really want to really look at that. That's not you know it's not key to have any chemical reaction occur, but it's key to setting up the process in the in, in the in the application. Okay. So let's address, let's talk about flow rate. You know, flow rate is a, is a very, very important part of the success of, of a chemical reaction, okay? Incorrect flow rate can give you a really effective results to the application. You know, sometimes when, you're, when you are looking at flow rates, you need to consider that you're gonna have different viscosities, different fluid characteristics, uh, the different pressures you're working at, and in, in very, in, in, in very in different flow rates you're going to require. So all of these have to be considered, and a lot of that can, that the pump can affect, in a sense that if if the material is viscous, you're going to have to adjust the the the, the flow rate to accommodate that. So it'll come out at the rate you're looking for it to be. Um, it can you know an incorrect mixture can definitely affect the composition of the material you're working with, and then you know, stoichiochemistry is, is really, you know, this is just the part of the chemistry that studies the amount of the substances that are involved in the reactions. This stoichiochemistry can be changed if the flow rate is either incorrect or is not steady. Um, sometimes, again, there are certain parts of your application where you just want stuff to go in there and you're not super concerned about accuracy or, or, or pinpoint um, dosing rates. But other times, this Tokyo chemistry can be affected uh, and, and can change the overall uh, reaction if the flow rate isn't accurate and, and isn't set correctly. And if you don't consider viscosity, if you don't consider temperature, you don't consider pressure, you don't consider chemical compatibility. We just talked about those things there. So flow rate is an important part of this, but those other pieces we just discussed can also affect flow rate. So you really need to take the time to focus that in. And I can tell you there's pumps out there that you can really get down to some high level of accuracy um, with your flow rate and, and the pulsation and the temperature. So there's different ways, different ways to equip a pump. Like for example, if you had a, a vertical syringe pump, not the tabletop one, but a vertical syringe pump, and you needed to affect the viscosity of the product uh, or the material, you could actually uh, put a temperature jacket on it and, and heat it or cool it. And, and change the viscosity just within the pump itself so it'll come out at a better flow rate, okay? Um, other things the flow rate can affect is resonance time. You know, it, if, if the flow rate isn't accurate or isn't correct in the state, in the state of static throughout the application, you can, the, 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 the amount of material in the reactor, can, how long it stays in there can be affected and then you can have chemical change within the reactor. Uh, that you're not looking for. Um, you know, it's it's the flow rates of what comes in there obviously affects the resonance time and reaction, and it can have an, act, an impact on the outcome. So you really need to have an accurate uh, pump focused on getting the right amount of material up. Um, you can regulate flow rate by adding a valve in the process, turning it on, turning it off, and electronically open and close at specific times. You can adjust the flow rate through the pump. You can have, you can change it from where you sit. You can change it on the pump. And obviously we talked about changing the viscosity of the fluid, temperature change. You know, it, it, other things that flow rate can affect are material integrity, color dissipation within the, within the material itself, if you're especially dealing with plastics. So really flow rate, accurate flow rate and correct flow rate is extremely important to the application itself. And the pump plays a significant part there. Knowing, knowing that you've, you've set it up and you've, you've worked with the pump and set the accurate flow rate, set the flow rate the way you want it, but the overall accuracy of the pump is important too. So again, for that, for maybe for that one chemical and the other ones, you don't need to be super accurate. So you gotta have to consider all of that. Pulsation, we talked about pulsation again before. Um, in some cases, people just want the fluid to get in there or material to get in there. So it doesn't matter if there's a blip, just hey, at the end, it'll get to the right rate. Other times you have you know, either expensive material or very volatile material or something that can be globbed up real easy and you need a steady, steady flow rate coming out. Pulsation is extremely important. The material can be damaged, you can have inconsistent flow, you can have glopping at the end of the nozzle or the tube or at the, in, in the front of the reactor. 
Um, some pumps that aren't, don't have you know, sort of the vertical syringe pumps that, uh, that are out on the market have extremely good pulsation, especially the ones from Teledisco. They have great, you're pretty much pulseless. But there are other types of pumps out there that you can add a pulse dampener to to minimize the pulsation as much as you possibly can. So don't want to weigh out, you know, you don't want to say, well, geez, if you, if you don't use this pump, you're going you're to have major issues. No, you, you can ha you'll have some pulsation you'll have to adjust it if you don't use a vertical syringe pump. Uh, this is just a graphical picture of, you know, just a pulse of slow at 25 PSI. Just to give you an idea of a, you know, a reciprocating pump uh, in, a, in, a, in a syringe pump uh, flow rates at those, at those levels. So that's just a graphical picture, but just gives you an idea of what I was just speaking about. The other thing to consider here is chemical compatibility. You know, the ability to pump to handle materials being used is extremely important. There's a lot of things that come into play here. If, if the material, the wetted material section of the pump isn't correct with the material you're using, the life of the pump can be affected, the performance, you could have safety issues, material integrity can be damaged, you could have leaching of the metal into the material. You really, really need to make sure that you consult some corrosion charts or, or chemical compatibility charts, either from the manufacturer or reach out to the manufacturer and just ask them the question, I'm using tooling or something else, and does it, does it, does it work with the metals that we have here? Now, granted, th th there's also other ways to look at that. You can have different fluid path materials on different types of pumps. There's, I mean, there's, there's a myriad of things out there, but you, most of the main ones are half alloy, P, PTFE, stainless steel, some type, whether it be Nitron 50 or SS316, and titanium. You know, you, you want to look at also when you're considering the chemical compatibility of the wetted fluid path of the pump you're using and for the process, you got to look at everything, not just the cylinder, the syringe, the hose. But you want to look at the seals too to make sure that those are completely compatible with the material you're using or pumping or moving. Because if you're, for instance, in some cases, certain types of seals, if you have particulates in your fluid, you're going to wear away the seal. You're going to re you're going to break the seal down faster than it should, and over time, the life and the performance of your pump will be affected. So these are key important things. You know, and then you know other types of pumping technologies can come into play with peristaltic pumps. You have a rotating head that squeezes something out of, hose, out of a hose. So you really only have to worry about the material content of the hose that the fluid goes through. And then if it, it becomes degraded, you click it off, take it off, put another one on. I mean, so there's, there's type, you, when you look at chemical compatibility, you look at the, if it's in the syringe, you look at the cylinder material. If it's in the reciprocating uh, pump, you look at the, the, the head pad, the head material. If it's in a pulse, uh, peristaltic pump, you look at the hose material. And, you know, there's many different chemical compatibility references online, either from our, us as a manufacturer or other manufacturers out there, or even just generically. Those are things you need, you really need to make sure you consider that and talk to the manufacturer about it because sometimes, you know, they, 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 can, uh, they can talk more about the mechanical or the metal makeup of their product. You know, again, other things to consider when you're looking at chemical compatibility is the concentration of fluid. 316 stainless is typically good for you know, hydrochloric acid at percentage of 5% or less. But what about above 5%? What do you use then? Or can you, do you have to have your process? Does your reaction have to work with 5%? Can I go to 3% and, and then work through a different way? So you, you want to look at that. And then temperature of fluid. You know, uh, just for example, sodium hydroxide can be handled in 316 stainless. And ambient, temp ambient temperatures, but if it gets to 120 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to pit the metal. So, it, you know, these are just two quick examples of the, the, the how concentration of fluid and the temperature of the fluid can affect it. And, you know, life expectancy of the pump. Is this pump that's designed to last forever? And, and then, you know, tie that with usage of the pump. Is it on eight hours a day? Is it on 24 hours a day? Is it on three months at a time? Is it on a week at a time? You know, looking at that, you know, you know, factor all of this in, and especially when you're talking to the manufacturer of the pump, you really want to kind of give them all this information you can, because what it'll do, it'll tie back, it'll, it'll, it'll help, you know, make sure that you get a pump that can get the correct flow rate you're looking for, the accuracy you're looking for, with minimal pulsation, and then it's, you know, chemically compatible, so you don't have to worry about breakdown of the pump or breakdown of the material or changing the overall material you're trying to move. 
So, you know, these are three pieces that are very important when you're looking at reaction chemistry and, and you're looking at a pump and you're trying to choose the right pump. We're trying to consider to choose the right pumps and the different types and different styles. We'll talk a little bit here shortly about different pumping styles and how, how they play, you know, the advantages, disadvantages, how they play into uh, flow chemistry. Okay. All the considerations I just kind of threw out here, we talked about footprint, the amount of space in your lab. You know, does your pump need to be mobile? So you wouldn't want a huge pump if it's going to have to be moved around unless you have a cart. You know, are you going to be using it once and then handing it off to somebody else? Or like universities, lots of times, will one lab will use it, then they'll, okay, they're done with it. Okay, let's move it over here and do this. And actually, I've seen chemical facilities do it too. Is the pump scalable? This is the other thing you want to consider when you're talking about reaction chemistry. You design the application, you design the experiment at the R&D level. So can we replicate this using this, the same pump we have? Or do we have to have a different type of pump or a different style of pumping technology or multiples of those pumps? You want to look at that because you want to consider the, you know, what made that reaction successful in, you know, actually a flow rate, et cetera. And then can we make sure we do that when we're scaling and then moving up the pilot? And then even more so when we get to production. You know, is, is the material, the equipment we're using, the reactor, the pump, the, the, the valves, are they all scalable to get me the, 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 the amount of material I'm looking for? And then, there, you know, are there location changes in a setup? Are you going from a hazardous to a non-hazardous area? You want to consider all that, especially when you're dealing with certain types of materials, right? You know, do I need continuous flow? In a lot of cases, you do, especially when we're talking about this application. It can be just a straight single head that's just flowing stuff in, straight in. You know, what other equipment do you need? You know, is it going to make things more expensive? You know, how will pumps or how will they be controlled? Is there an interoperability um, capability here as far as a platform that runs everything, all of the products at once or the different pumps at once? Um, and then what data do you need to collect? You need to get GMP data, you need to get FDA data, you need all of that. These are other little considerations that are not tied to the actual reaction and setting it up itself, excuse me, the reaction happening itself and how the pump actually works in that reaction. But these are considerations that help you think about when you're choosing the right pump to, to, for your application. You need to look at all of these pieces. You need to look at the reaction you're trying to create, is it chemically compatible? Is the flow rate going to get there a lot? But also these other considerations. So you get the right product. Then you're not trying to fit the reaction to the pump. The pump's going to fit your reaction. So let's quickly look at our pumping technology here. So uh, we'll talk about syringe pump technology. As you know, Teledyne Nisco sells syringe pumps. You know, it, it's a product that's uh, the design is very long lasting. There's pumps out there that last over 20, 25, 30 years. It is as pulses as you're going to get when it comes to a pump. Very precise flows down to 0.5%. Um, you can get up to higher pressures with this type of a design. This design, so one of our pumps goes to 30,000 PSI. If you need that, it's there. This type of technology is out there for it. You know, some disadvantages is you're going to have a pretty, you might have a, a high investment up front. But over the life of the product, it's going to actually balance itself out from an ROI standpoint significantly. You may spend you may spend 50% more than another type of pumping technology, but this pumping technology is durable, can last, it's going to be very accurate and pulseless. And in some cases, they have larger footprints than other pumps. You know, some have even larger within the syringe pump world. Sample applications you would see in flow chemistry with a syringe pump is creating extremely small fluid streams and microfluidic applications. And you need to have very, very minute dose, you know, down to a 0 0.00001 milliliters per minute. You can do that with this, with syringe pump, with a vertical syringe pump technology. And then it's, you know, even under, uh, even with viscous substances, under high pressure, you can use this, this type of pumping technology. You, you know, you, you just make sure it's, you, it's, it's viscous, you can handle it, and you've set the flow rate to be what you expect it to be. When I'm talking about syringe pump technology here, I am not talking about the small tabletop ones like the Harvards out there you just see. This is more of the Teledynisco style uh, vertical syringe pump. Oops. The second type of uh, pump is more of a reciprocating technology or piston pump or HPLC or uh, typically you'll see them as HPLC pumps. 
you know, you can get high pressure, low flow, very common design, like a steam engine. You can see the little rotating thing, very, very easy to understand. You know, it's, um, some disadvantages is struggles with viscous fluid. So if you have a very viscous fluid, you probably need to eliminate this thinking here, unless you're going to heat it up prior to sending into the pump, then it makes it less viscous and it gets it through there. Um, there are check valves in this type of technology. Check valves do get gummed up sometimes, so you have to consider that when you're looking at the material and the, and the, and the chemicals you're dealing with. And it's not pulseless. So this is one of the style, one of the, the styles of pumping I was talking about that you can add a pulse dampener to it that will eliminate or at least shrink down the amount of pulsation that is actually occurring um, as you're uh, pumping it out. Is it going to be as, as, as pulseless as a syringe pump? No, that's not, not, not going to be the case. But it is a that good close second for you uh, if you need to choose that. You know, sample applications, you're going to be feeding reagents into the applications. And in, in this type of pump, especially the ones from Tel Aviv, the Reaxis series, they can provide pressure. It just, if it just needs to provide constant pressure, it has to, you, you can do that. So sometimes you have applications where I just need to have a steady, steady pressure coming in to help the reaction or help some other things occur. This is a good pump for that. The next type of pump work I was just talking about is a peristaltic pump. You know, this is a pumping technology that's rather interesting. You know, it's, it's, there's no wetted parts. The fluid stays in the hose. Unless you have a rupture, then that's, a, that's an issue, et cetera. Very low contamination risk. You know, if you're using volatile materials and you have the right hose, hose material there, you can literally just take the head off the pump, throw away, and put a new head up. You know, you have sanitary hose availability that's designed for food creation or, or, or in human, in body type um, materials. Easy, easy made, low downtime. Disadvantages is you gotta monitor your hose life. Um, you have to consider the hose wear with how long the pump's gonna be on, the type of material that you're running through there, the chemical compatibility of the chemical to the hose, and just the, the, the temperature. It is not pulseless. You will always see blips here, but if you just need to feed something in, it works great. Um, sometimes as you age, uh, I don't know the time window of the aging, but as this type of technology ages, you have to calibrate it. So this is one that will take a little more focus to watch it, make sure it keeps the accurate flow rates that you're looking for. But it's a nice complement if you need, you could use all three of these different types of pumps to create your application or create your chemical reaction to happen. If you need precise, precise dosing from the one, from the syringe pump, you just need a steady flow uh, with, with a little bit, with a little bit of pulsation from the reciprocating pump, then use this to push stuff in. You know, sample applications here, feeding viscous, highly viscous material. This is really good for viscous material because the rollers will squeeze the material out. So if you have something that's viscous, this is one you want to look at. And lastly, the diaphragm pump technology. This is kind of a this is kind of a, a pumping technology you don't see too often in the chemical reaction world, but maybe you do from the AC Lewas or or something like that that people use. You know, it's less expensive, little maintenance, uh, little risk of leakage. It's literally just a it's a it's a it's a bladder that moves back and forth, whether it be metal or rubber, and it uses a reciprocating motion like the reciprocating pump. So instead of moving a piston of balls back and forth using the pressure, you're using you're using the piston to move the the create a wave with the diaphragm. You know, it struggles with particulates. Definitely struggles with particulates. Um, it, it, some particulates and material can actually wear away the diaphragm. Um, you have check valves that get fouled up, and it can, needs to be primed. That could be a tricky thing to do. Again, the application I see here is just feeding material to application. I don't see this very often in, in, the, in the chemical reaction world. I see more syringe reciprocating and peristaltic than I see this. So folks, just real quickly, just a little chart here to show you, you know, the different pumping types, advantages. We talk about pulseless flow, no other parts, advantages, disadvantages, and it's a relatively, you know, like they do with the higher end restaurants, expensive, not expensive, et cetera. But you gotta look at when you, you know, if you're looking at the cost of the product, how long will it last, how long are you gonna use it, and is it gonna, you know, if you need something to be extremely precise and it has to be, or it's gonna mess up the reaction and mess up the material you have, you're probably gonna wanna put some money in it to get the guarantee that the product will do it. And, and that's what you look at here uh, across the board, okay? With that, I'm gonna kind of open it up to questions. Um, I have myself online, and I have a, a technical specialist, I believe, online in Nebraska that can, um, can answer some questions for us, too. Tori, are there any questions? Um, you know, I haven't seen any questions come through yet, so if you do have a question, feel free to use either the chat 
or the Q&A function in the platform. And while we wait to see if any questions do come in, uh, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all um, attendees and registrants uh, later on, um, either later today or tomorrow. Um, so be on the lookout for that as well. We'll give it just a, oh, here, I think we have a question that has come in, or no, that's just a, uh, that was just a thank you for your presentation. So, again, thank you for using the chat function. Um, we're open, and we'll give it a few more minutes for questions or comments, uh, so feel free to share. And after we end the webinar today, if you do have any questions um, that you may not have thought of during the webinar and you want to reach out to us, we are always available and ready to discuss um, the different things that Nick has shared with us today. So feel free to reach out um, to either Nick or Teledyne ISCO in general, and we can send it along. Um, that contact information is just iscoinfo at teledyne.com. So that's a, a general box and we'll get that along to Nick or Dale uh, to connect with you. Uh, Nick, we do have one question that came in. Okay. Can we see in the future a text versions? Uh, I would def I would say from the standpoint of uh, overall pumps, uh, a text is an important uh, uh, certification to have. Uh, Getting a, a certain types of pumps in certain cases will be tougher than others uh, from the standpoint of you know, arcing, sparking, et cetera, meeting the, the, just the, the real rigorous certifications that ATEX uh, require you to. I would say from the ISCO standpoint, that is something we're definitely considering that in IEC2X, I think it is. Uh, we, we, we are definitely looking at that from the standpoint of uh, overall pump offering. Um, I cannot give you a timeline at this point um, because certification for that is pretty difficult uh, and I have gone through it in a few other cases in my, in my previous lives, but um, you know, we, we know there's requests and requirements out there for that. Um, I would like to know more about the application. So if you wanted to take some time and email me, per, uh, email me or email to in, uh, ISCO info, just some of the little bit, uh, the nuts and bolts about the application you're speaking of. I think that'd be great uh, information for us. I'd like to start that conversation with you so I can get a little more input and learn a little bit more about that. But that in short, it is, it is something that is, we know we've heard requests for, and we just have to determine how to achieve that in, in which pumping style that we have that we currently sell, or is it something else? Okay. Another question that has come in, how do you handle pumping reagents that precipitate from solution, deal with clogging, particulates, et cetera? Uh, this is Dale Clay. I, I can uh, answer the question, or at least attempt to answer the question. Uh, for syringe pumps, you know, some particulates, it kind of depends if they're hard, hard particulates or soft particulates. Uh, soft particulates uh, usually aren't a problem. The concern is that they precipitate inside the pump. Will it cause, uh, say, additional seal wear? Uh, or, or, or other other problems, but if they're soft particulates, that generally isn't a problem. Other than they could possibly settle out within the pump. Uh, we do have uh, mixers and things like that, and other kinds of options which will keep it in in the solution inside the pump. Uh, as far as outside the pump, as far as particulates, uh, slurries or, or or those kinds of things, uh, we have options in many cases for larger tubing sizes prevent plugging. Uh, the valves that we use are a type of uh, needle valves. Uh, we also have options for ball valves, which have a less restriction. So we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to uh, handle particulates. Uh, if you have any other, uh, any more details on that, be feel free to send us a message and, and we can respond in, in much more detail.
Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your time today to um, walk through this webinar. We appreciate it. Again, this will be sent out to all uh, participants um, later on this week for your reference. Um, and if you do have any questions or comments following, again, please feel free to use isco.info at teledyne.com and we will pass it along accordingly. Thanks to Nick for walking through all of this valuable information today. Um, we appreciate everyone's time and have a great Wednesday.